I guess I'm the one who starts it. Yes, yes. So must I start? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Greetings to you all and welcome to the Africa TESOL Decentering ELT series. This is the fourth and final webinar of the series that we've been having. Our host is Africa Tesla, supported by the Hornby Trust. Speaking to you is Retabile Mawela. I'm the Publications Officer for Africa Tesla. With me is Harry Kucha. He is the advisor of Africa Tesol. The two of us will be moderating the discussion for today. Harry, please say hi to the audience. Hello, hello everyone. Good to be here again for this uh, fourth and final uh, webinar in our uh, Decentering ELT series. Thank you. For the sake of those who are with us for the first time today, let me just highlight some of the things that we've been doing over the past few weeks. In our first webinar, we focused on defining decentering ELT. What is it? What is this decentering? And the discussion, the panelists um, described it as a proposal to um, help English language teachers to be more efficient and effective in their classrooms. And the advice that the English language teachers were given is that they must be wary, they must be skeptical of um, taking literally everything from the West. And that they need to look into themselves and realize that they've got the capacity to solve most, if not all, the problems in the English language uh, class. That was the focus of the first webinar. In the second webinar, it was the issue of identifying the center. The issue was which one is the center that we are being advised to move away from. And the center is, or has been over the years, the West. As you know, the West has always been um, famous for directing things, and especially in the teaching of English. The West has always provided the material, the way to teach, the pedagogy, you know, all that. And we have been taking that and taking it as it is. And some of the things we took were not even working for our contexts in our different countries, in our different continents. We just took whatever. And now the focus is we need to start thinking differently. In the third webinar, the, the, the panelists were saying we are already trying to shift from the center. However, there are some challenges. And one of the ma major challenges that they highlighted was that it is it takes a long time, or it is quite a mammoth task to shift teachers from depending on the center, so to say. Because the center can always also be, I, I, I didn't mention that the center can also be the ministries of education in the different countries that we are in. And so, and so it's like the teachers struggle to to shift from over depending on the center. Talk of the difficulty of teaching an old dog new tricks, you know, think something like that. Uh, but anyway, nevertheless, we were happy in over, over all these uh, webinars, there were other, there were examples of people who are running projects, who have run projects that signify this decentering. And so as we get into uh, to this last one, we already have this idea. And we've got a team of people here who are going to talk to us more about this. But we'd like to <coughs> with um, introducing them. 
or should and we just start with talking first? No, that's fine. Today we've got uh, Martin Wedell, my, my colleague and, and mentor here at the University of Leeds, who is representing the Hornby uh, uh, Trust decentering team at this webinar. Uh, we're happy to have you, Martin, and we are looking forward to, to listening to you, to sharing your wisdom and your ideas, your experiences of working with teachers and more recently across Sub-Saharan Africa in relation to the theme of today's uh, uh, se uh, session. We also have uh, Harriet Ndikum from Cameroon, who is a current holder of uh, Hornby uh, Project Awards, uh, which focuses on supporting teachers in uh, the, the northwest of Cameroon, where, as we know, there have been huge uh, civil uh, challenges ongoing for the last couple of years. We have uh, um, uh, Rabea uh, from uh, Belta, Bangladesh, who current, is currently ho uh, running a project uh, that also benefited from the Hornby Award. And uh, Rabia, your pro Rabia, your project is connecting underprivileged children and tertiary students through cross-age teaching, a hand-in-hand -hand ELT approach. Maria uh, Laura, uh, who's from Argentina, I was going to say you're representing FAPI, but actually it's APIBA, and your project is APIBA on tour and it's an ongoing project. So our panelists for today are talking about ongoing projects, unlike last week when we were listening to projects that have already been completed, apart from one. Our panelists for today are talking about projects that recently won the award and are ongoing and probably have been affected in different ways by uh, the pandemic. So we are very happy that you agreed to join us to share uh, your experiences and your projects. And we thought this are uh, up to date because they are very current. And we hope that our membership, our listeners would benefit from listening to your projects and asking questions. So over to you, Rita Rile. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, we will start with you. I've just been asking myself about the trigger. What is it, in your opinion, that prompted this uh, the Hornby Trust to, to get into this initiative of trying to encourage uh, teachers to shift from the center. What, what was the trigger? And while you are at that, I'd like you to then, you know, walk with us further and maybe you could even give us some of the success stories that you people have had. Over to you. Thank you, Reza Bile. Uh, I mean, you've said a lot already about decentering, but I suppose the trigger, the trigger for for us all, the, the sort of half dozen of us who who have been thinking about this for a year or so, with 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 friends from elsewhere, the trigger is that basically centering doesn't work. You know? That we've all had experience over, well, in my case, over sort of three 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 to four decades of working in different parts of the world and seeing the negative effects on teachers and learners of impossible att of, of attempts to try and do things that are not actually appropriate for the classrooms that they're working in. And I think the, the that's, had a, that's, that's had a sort of very, very negative, negative effect this notion that practices that come from one place can be um, expected to work somewhere else has, and that teachers should just basically do what they're told, which is also another great global phenomenon, um, has uh, at least two very negative effects. Firstly, it perpetuates this notion that actually teachers, English classroom English teachers, aren't capable of ever working out anything for themselves, don't actually have the capacity to uh, identify what's appropriate for their own classrooms. Um, it also has very negative effects on teacher education and, and teacher professional development, because the models of 
teacher education and professional development reflect these centered ideas. And actually, when delivered or offered to people in their multiple contexts, the content of a lot of uh, professional development training and and particular particularly and te initial teacher training uh, turns out to be well, if not completely irrelevant, at least substantially irrelevant for the classrooms that the teachers, the novice teachers go into when they leave their training and the experienced teachers return to after the training. So, I mean, personally, I, I just feel we so much time and energy and money and effort has been put into the teaching of English globally in the last 30 years that when we when historians look back at it they will laugh at us for the, the the absurdity of what we think we were trying to do not encouraging the teaching of english everywhere necessarily though people may argue about that too but the way we have tried to do it as if there was very a one right way is uh, has has been ridiculous and therefore I think all of us in the decentering group agree that we need to move much more towards some towards a situation where teachers are invited not to look elsewhere for the issues that they face, the challenges that they face, but that teachers in local contexts should be thinking about thinking about and thinking about what what works. For them, why it works for them, and that there should be much more sharing of what works locally. That we need to move from a glow, if you like, from a global notion of ELT to a very, very local version of ELT. And that although some of the ideas that come from the middle, the centers, which, as you said, Retabili is not well, it is largely the West which ministries then seize as formulas, formulas for their own contexts, and which then possibly even, you know, some teachers associations seize as formulas for the way that they ought to conduct themselves. Um, that we need to really move away from this notion of the formula to the, to celebrating and acknowledging the the diversity of context and the different ways in which people in different places are going to find to do to work with their learners. Um, it of course involves uh, you know, a different role for teachers, and I mean I think I think the decentering uh, initiative, in a sense, as well as relating to. Uh, some of the sort of as well as I mean actually also fits in with this idea globally that you know teachers are actually autonomous and capable individuals rather than mere appliers of other people's ideas mere te mere people who turn the pages of the textbook if there is one um, or and actually recognizing that uh, if we want teachers, if decentering is to have any uh, any any meaning at all, it also means a different a different role for teachers, i.e., they are not just technicists. And this is, I mean, this is a global problem. Not, I mean, it's just as much of a problem in the UK this attitude towards teachers as as it is in many other countries. This notion of the teacher as someone basically. You know, if it's Tuesday, it must be Unit Five, and everybody turns to Unit Five. Teachers are expected not to be initiators, but to be remain sort of passive and obedient uh, implementers of other people's ideas. Um, and we need a we need a transition for, away from that towards teachers towards recognizing that teach. Of towards teachers recognizing 
that sort of individually and with their colleagues, they can uh, they can explore ways of doing things in their own contexts that probably are likely to be more effective than the messages or the, the recommendations that they get from their superiors at whatever levels we're talking about. So it's a matter of very much changing our attitude as teachers from being sort of passive recipients of orders as to what we're supposed to do towards actually becoming, recognizing our own abilities and capacities to carry out the orders, but in a way that works for us, not necessarily in a way that's going to work in the capital or 200 miles away or a thousand miles away or 5,000 miles away. So I, th I think that's how we've, uh, that's how I anyway have come to be uh, part of this group. A disappointment with the efforts that have been made over the last 25, 30 years to, uh, to help teachers uh, to help teachers help learners to actually achieve something in their classrooms rather than just continue to do the same things they have been doing for ages and for the majority of learners I think if if we're honest the majority of learners globally to leave school after a decade maybe of learning English with very limited capacity to do anything with it and that seems to me an absolute tragedy. And that, to me, seems likely to continue unless we do empower and encourage and support teachers to work out their own ways of helping learners really get something from their English language learning. That's, that's my rant finished here, I think. Well said. Well said. Sounds excellent. Yes, I, I like the way you have put it. it, it it's almost like an insult to say that uh, English language teachers are incapable, you know, of doing things themselves. Thank you. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's, I mean, it's, and nobody says it explicitly, but it's implied by the, the lack of encouragement that there is for people to begin to identify what works for them. Yeah. And, and I guess a lot of it too is not, yeah, it's implied, but often also it's because teachers are always at the receiving end of rebuke for, 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 for policies and sometimes uh, wrong policies when they don't go right. And, and, and the tendency that, um, that uh, people would always find, would want to find fault in what the teachers are doing rather than find what's good just so that they can justify their being in a position to tell teachers what, what to do. So in a sense, the, 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 the centering has got to do with a kind of empowerment of teachers to see themselves as generate people, com, com, people, well, if I'm just rephrasing you, Martin, people who are capable of generating knowledge from their lived experiences within a specific working context and who need to be respected for, for that. If you permit me, we, we, we've got three really compelling examples here of teachers working together in, in as local communities, supporting each other uh, uh, without necessarily having to depend on an external source of knowledge, saving them from some situation which, which is otherwise created for the purpose of, 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 of making teachers uh, feel, continue to feel dependent. So could we start with Harriet, for example, your project? Could you share with us your project, please? Just, just start by telling us the title of your project because I missed that one in the introduction. Thank you very much, Harry. Thank you, Martin, for the wonderful introduction you've given. Our project was titled Addressing the Needs and Learners, the Needs of teachers and learners in a crisis situation. I am Kamelta. We have Kamelta, the Cameroon English Language and Literature Teachers Association. And I am of the Northwest chapter. 
the Northwest chapter, one of the Anglophone regions. And we've been going through crisis as the right secretary for the past four years, where they've been called for no schools. Many children have not gone to school. Teachers have not been teaching. And last year, there were a few functional schools. So in June 2019, when the Hornby Trust advertise these projects for what we can do as a teacher organization in our own local context. ELTS, Camelton Northwest thought we could do something with a few functional schools we had to address the needs of teachers and learners in a crisis situation. It will be good we recall that what we are going through is really, really terrible. Children have not gone to school for one, two, three, four years. We did send a questionnaire to 500 students and 100 teachers. And evaluating their responses on the questionnaire, we thought we had to do something. They had academic problems, psychological problems, social problems. The trauma is really too much. But borrowing from the concept of EIE, education in emergency, be it caused by conflict, war, disaster, man-made or natural, our case we fall under the armed crisis, the armed conflict. We said, if all else fails, education should not fail. So as Teachers Association, Camelta Northwest, we put our heads together, a team of five experienced teachers, young and old alike, examiners and teacher trainers. In short, we were three females and two males. We put our heads together to address this appalling situation where children are afraid. There are some, they have lost all their course books. Their teachers, they don't have course material. They have not updated their work for, for the past three. And for this year, the fourth year, some are not even current with the syllabus and whatever is happening in the Ministry of Secondary Education. So we said things cannot continue like this. After evaluating the questionnaire, we saw the needs expressed by the learners and the teachers. And we came up with five workshop modules, five workshop modules in our way, in our little way, locally, we're working with our experience, what we see, and we are looking for local experience to try to solve the problem. And the five models we came up, handled by these five teachers, and I would like to share that these five teachers, they came from the government sector, from the government secondary schools, from the lay private secondary schools, and from the mission secondary schools. So we made it all involving so they'll have a field to touch all these various uh, sectors of education in our local region. The very first module was handling learner psychosocial problems in a classroom. When we're sharing, teachers told us there are times a child will come to school just one out of the four days. It would be surprising to hear I'm talking of four days. We don't go to school here from Monday to Friday. Mondays are declared lockdown days. Nobody goes out. So our school week starts on Tuesdays and we end on Fridays. And at times, because of gunshots, because of other difficulties, a learner can access school just once in the four days or maximum twice or thrice. You hardly have a child or a learner who goes to school four on four. So we thought with all these psychosocial problems they had, if the teacher is indifferent to irregular attendance, then the teacher will not be able to carry the teaching and the learning process. So that was the first module. The teacher should have the listening ear. The teacher should be able to motivate the children to tell their story as a healing process. Because when they tell their story, they can perch, and then there'll be a way for them to move forward. The second module, we title it, Building peace messages in a language classroom. We realize that from the social media, the television, the radio, the little talks around, there was a lot of hate speech, hate language that was almost being taken as gospel truth. 
So we thought the classroom can be that only place that can preach peace and motivate us to practice peace. So we captioned the second module, bring a building peace messages in the classroom. We brought popular slogans from popular writers about peace. Like peace is not the absence of war, love begins with peace, give peace now, peace can only be now, and things like that. And we encourage them, those who attended the workshop, the teachers who attended the workshop, to take this module to their various classes, build these peace messages, and put it around their classrooms. So that as a, the learners who assess their classrooms, when they enter and they see these peace messages, it will speak a different language to them and not the hate language we hear every day. So we build that module and it is working. In short, I visited some classroom of some teachers who attended and I saw some of those peace messages already displayed on the board, on the walls, by the learners themselves, various handwriting, various designs, and I was really, really elated. The third module was students learning styles. We know we have the, the various learning styles of students. We have the visual learners. We have the audio learners. We have the, I mean, all the type of learners. And then in a crisis situation like this, if we don't take into consideration the different learning styles, we will just be teaching and learning will not be taking place. We will be struggling to cover the content, the material, the syllabus, and the children will be empty at the end of the course. So we thought the teacher has to take time off, know their learners, know their different learning styles, and put them together in his or her boat and move with them together. So we thought that was an important module to handle, especially in crisis. The fourth module was remedial teaching. In a regular situation, having a regular school year, we will always be tempted to think that remediation should come at the end, maybe at the end of a topic, at the end of a course, at the end of a term. But in crisis, as what we are facing, we saw that remediation should rather be at the beginning because you are having a class of learners who have lost different school periods. Some have lost one year, two years, three years, and they all find themselves in the same class, in front of the same teacher. What are their levels? What do they miss out? Where are they? Can you successfully carry all of them through? So we coach our teachers in this workshop to always give priority to remedial teaching. Whenever you're taking a step forward and you realize that a handful of students are backward, in this or in that topic of language teaching, take a pause, two steps behind, and you address the situation. And I think like that, the, lead, the teaching and the learning will be better. So we discovered in our situation that remediation should not be at the end of the school year, or at the end of the term. It should be now, always, and ongoing. The very last module we formulated was the need for continuous professional development. Because from the questionnaire, especially from the teachers, when we ask, what is it that you think you actually need now in this crisis situation to be a better teacher? Most of them, they, them told us they need continuous professional development. So we thought we should bring this in and show them all the various avenues as language teachers where they can build themselves for different situations. I mean, in, 20, in 2015, if you had asked any teacher in the Northwest or in the Southwest region, what their teaching would be in 2016 up to 2020, they will tell you the regular things. But when the crisis set in, every other thing has changed. And we say, if we are in a crisis situation, we also have to look for crisis measures to put things back on the rail. This is what we did, my dear uh, uh, colleagues. We have some joys. I don't know if I should go on. Should I go on with our joys, our success story? Mm. Okay. Okay. From the feedback we got, from the feedback we got, the teachers, those who attended, but I must say, 
we were targeting a hundred teachers, a hundred teachers to as, attend the workshop, but only 60 made it. And when we were struggling to find out why we fell short by 40, we learned on that same day, they were gone short in some neighborhoods so the teachers could not come out, transport difficulty, and then some teachers had already been earmarked as people who are going to school, and so they were threats on their life. Some of them were even kidnapped. But we were still happy to work with the 40. The feedback from them was very positive. Most of them have taken their knowledge into the, to their departmental meetings. And this team of five, we put our heads together and distributed ourselves to the functional schools, visiting the teachers of English there, especially in their departmental meeting, and then continuing these modules, ironing out, answering their questions together as a team, because I must confess, we are not experts. We were just working with the little material that came our way. We are equally very happy that our delegation, the delegation of secondary education Northwest has been very, very supportive. In short, our coordinating inspector, he opened the workshop, attended the work, all the five modules from start to finish, and equally gave his inputs. With the, upcom with the coming up of the COVID-19, there have been these uh, uh, seminars, psychosocial healing seminars, and distance and media teaching slots on our local radio and television. These five members who put this material together, we have been invited every now and then for television and for radio teaching. I think that is a success story because of the Hornby project. We are very happy for that. The positive feedback too is our students now they feel open. They know we are empathic. They know we are all in the same pot of soup. Permit me use that. And so they are open sharing their stories with us. And when they share their difficulties with us and we listen empathically and talk with them, it is a lot of support. I would just like to share this experience with you. I am a teacher in a school which is not functional. But in the neighborhood where I live, all the teachers know that this is a teacher of English language. So every now and then they come to my house. Madam, can you help me in directed writing? Madam, I have this problem in composition. Madam, can you mark this work for me? I've been doing all of that in my home. My textbooks are not on my reading table. My textbooks are with a few students who have braved it all to go back to school. I don't have any textbook in my keeping. It is a success story. Something is happening somewhere. And then for the functional schools, a few functional schools, since we send letters of uh, invitation to the teachers, they also are inviting us to talk with, because we're inviting just their teachers of English language. They saw the material that we shared. They have been calling us to their departmental meetings to talk to the entire staff, teachers of geography, history, economics, and all the other subjects. So that has been a success story. It has not all been roses. The crisis is still on. This is the fourth year. We can only pray that things should go to normalcy so that come October, because of the COVID, we can go back to school. So if time permits, I'll share some of our sorrows. Thank you. Wow. Wow, wow Harriet. Wow. Thank you for such a powerful testimony. It's actually... It's actually uh, touching. Yeah, it, it, it really does. Uh, the comments on the chat box are saying it brings tears to eyes. Yes, we all feel like, wow, this is very sad. I'm noting here that there are three females and two males. Uh, I'm noting that with, uh, with a lot of interest, you know. <clears throat> four, four females, four <laughs> females, you mean. <laughs> I mean, in the, in the team that, uh, that uh, the Harriet oh, is talking yeah. about. It, it's three uh, females and two gentlemen. Am I right, Harriet? And Very right. Yeah. Females, right. I, I, I want to, 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 to zoom into that. Okay. Is this because the gentlemen are too scared to brave it? You know, because I know in my country, it's us women who are brave enough to... Can you talk to us about that? The, 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 the balance of gender there. Okay, the gentlemen were not scared. They were not scared at all. Okay. The issue is this, the vision bearer was Dr. Mrs. Fortune. 
Dr. Mrs. Fortune was the vision bearer of all of this. And she is of the tertiary. So she turned around and met me. I am the president of Camelta Northwest. Mm -hmm. I've been the president for the past six years. So when she met me and shared that there is this project by Honey, can we give a try to it? I told her that there was no problem. And she said, bring two other people. So I turned around and I brought a lady to join me and two males. And then Dr. Mrs. Focho was like our coach. She was coaching us. So that is how we came about. And we were afraid to make it very wide. You know, at times meeting as teachers, can be an eye opener for people who don't want school. So wanted a very small team where we can meet somewhere and work on notice. So that is why we made the team just a team of five. And I'm very happy for these five uh, team members who gave in their all for us to realize or for us to be on the process of realizing because we are still working the project. Excellent job, excellent job. Harry, would you just like to, to say? Just to clarify a few things, because I come from that part of the country and I'm in a sense, even though from a distance, part of what's happening. And that's why I did comment in the chat box. I said, the story is bringing me to tears because it brings many things alive. And it's great to see people like Harriet doing the work they are doing despite the risk. So just to put things in perspective, last year in November, my uncle who was a a school uh, a principal in that town where Harriet is working was kidnapped and a, and a ransom of about five, uh, 3,000 pounds was taken from the family to release him. His son was killed one week after his release coming back from school and we finally lost him in February this year. So that's just me and one family of the many other families who lose family members because of things like that. And so uh, there the, the, the are forces who don't want people to go to school, but they're also on both sides of the rebels and the government, men are generally uh, uh, more susceptible to being, uh, to, to being suspected of supporting the rebels and then being shot. So there might be issues like that, but of course children and women are taking the big shot in many ways. And to see a team like hers stepping up and doing the work they are doing is something really worth celebrating. And thank you, Harriet. For, for, for agreeing to come to this session. When I approached Harriet, uh, the problem was technical issues and we just really had to work extra hard to, to, to be here. So it's not just about coming, but the technology in that part of the country, as you know, at one point, internet was cut completely from that part of the country by the government for all sorts of reasons. So it's a real big thing. Thank you so much. We will be coming back to you, Harriet. Uh, in a moment, because I've got a few questions to ask, but I thought we should we just move on to our next speaker, uh, Rabea from Belta, Bangladesh. Thank you, Harry. Uh, can you repeat me, everyone? Can you listen to me? Okay, am I audible? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Thank yes. you, Harry, for reaching out to me. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be here with the and with parts of the world and with Martin Riddle. Um, so I am Rabi Binta Habib. I'm the team leader of Hornby Trust Project here in Bangladesh. I also serve voluntarily Bangladesh English Language Teachers Association as its publication secretary. So I work at Daffodil International University, Bangladesh as an assistant professor in the Department of English. So the presentation highlights that I'm going to uh, talk about today uh, is basically uh, what the project is about, who were involved in it, uh, who did we target to teach, and then what were the phases, how this project is now affected by COVID, and what are we thinking as part of uh, the future of this project. So, um, first of all, Delta, if you do not know, is Bangladesh English Language Teachers Association. So, um, it started its, its journey in 1984, and it went into a long hibernation period. Uh, before it was revived in 2003. Belter's vision and mission uh, involved empowering English teachers. So that is at the center of it. Um, uh, but the project that I'm here to talk about is basically what revolves around students. So it has to do with uh, my involvement with these students. What I have been doing uh, since I have been a teacher since 2012. I joined Daffodil International University, the campus that you are seeing, in 2012. So my concerns uh, uh, for students uh, on their habit of memorization, 
on their habit of being passive intakers, basically um, led me towards planning a few um, projects that I uh, actually um, designed with my stu uh, students. There are various projects that I carried on with my students. One of them is students teaching students. So can you see the website? Uh, so students, one of them is students teaching students. So this project started in 2016. What students did under this project, they used to teach their junior mates of the department. So the students of a course titled Introduction to ELT, English Language Teaching. They used to teach their junior mates of the department who were the freshers um, with their team planned lessons their customized games, puzzles, and classroom activities. The, the more they could uh, engage students in their classrooms, they had better chances to win. Um, so basically they were uh, in a team, they had problems to solve, they had free task phase, and they had the during task demonstration, and they had post task assessment. So the assessment would be uh, done uh, in a three-folded manner. Uh, the students that we had in the classroom were one of the assessors and also the uh, evaluators, also the local ELT experts. They, they were invited in our classes. So you can see the uh, um, local ELT experts uh, sitting um, here in the classroom and the classroom is usually uh, an auditorium. So students, so think of final year students teaching an auditorium full of students uh, with their customized lesson plans and games and activities and they are giving their best to uh, win the race. Now, uh, my objective was to help them shun their habit formation um, practice that they have been doing since their students. Uh, and this is a problem that we have here in Bangladesh and in many other contexts that students rely on habit formation, students rely on memorization. If you ask them, how are you? They will be replying, I'm fine, thank you, how are you? Because they memorize. And when you are going to say, what? hey, buddy, what's up? They would look up, thinking, okay, what is that? Because they memorize, how are you? They did not memorize or understand how, what to reply when you say, what's up, buddy? So this memorization uh, was a concern uh, to me personally as a teacher. And as I grew as a teacher, I wanted my students to lead them. And uh, you can see, I would like to talk about especially this picture here. You can see the winning moment. So every time in every Students Teaching Students event, uh, the team that would uh, win had these expressions. So um, basically uh, with this project, I got what I wanted. My students, my learners agency, my learners control on their own learning, my learners involvement in their learning and their and, the, and having fun out of learning. So what does it have to do with um, this project that I'm here to talk about? Uh, that because I, am, I, wanted, I wanted to involve students in uh, various uh, learning. So the Students City students continued from 2016 till today. So uh, the, it's needless to say that cross-age teaching has its benefits and we are having it here. So um, when this Hornby Trust proposal came in, I requested Belta that can I have uh, this project? And uh, they agreed. I'm thankful to Belta, who agreed. I submitted my uh, proposal um, involving students. Uh, and this time we gave a new dimension that we wanted to teach um, underprivileged children under our project. So uh, we basically, uh, went for looking schools that teach uh, underprivileged children. Now, who are these underprivileged children? How do we define underprivileged uh, children or these schools? Uh, we went for schools that uh, teach the ready-made garments workers children or the textile workers children. Now, this area is quite less explored yet because uh, if we look at the uh, UN reports or the uh, sustainability development goal uh, reports made for this, we find that the uh, children living in the semi-urban areas are deprived of quality education because most of them, they are the children of ready-made garments workers who barely earn as less as 70 to 80 pounds a month. So how will a, 
I mean, apparently able to provide quality education with one dollar a day, with two dollars a day. So that is nearly impossible. So they send their children to schools where, which are definitely government-run uh, school, and these schools are again even within the government parameter much um, uh, underprivileged. So we went for one of those schools. Uh, instead of planning to go to many schools, uh, I, we prefer to go for one school. Uh, and the school's name is Asha Textile Mills. This school was established to teach the uh, children of garments workers. So um, we went to this only one, only this school because I wanted to have a significant impact. So instead of dividing two or three classes and having three or four schools, not having a significant impact, we wanted to have a significant impact on one of the schools and few children, at least within this um, project. So uh, the project was designed with three phases in it. Uh, the phase one includes the training and teaching demo and the initial questionnaire survey, which, you could, which we could successfully complete. Um, because, although we, have, we, de we are delayed due to some unavoidable circumstances, but we could complete. But we are stuck at phase two. We could not uh, implement all the lessons that we have planned for the classes. Uh, we are stuck here because of COVID-19. Uh, so we hope that the school reopens by the end of the year and then we can complete it. So uh, we uh, had to encounter a few problems. They were elected, they were the second largest Muslim congregation that takes place here in Bangladesh. And this school was, as it is a, a government school, this school was one of the premises for the Muslim congregation. So we could not enter into the school as part of the plan. And we had our um, uh, training that was designed to take place in January, but in February due to those problems. So, uh, but time to time in January, I kept meeting with the students. Uh, we had the lessons ready. Uh, we, uh, students were trained by the LT experts. Um, uh, in these pictures on the top, uh, you can see the belt advisor, the uh, immediate first president, Hornby alumni, and um, the Dean Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences in, at my workplace, they all uh, train these students with the issues that they may face when going to an underprivileged um, school, a uh, low resource school. So, and they were trained and uh, they were ready to go to school. Uh, but we had the initial survey and not surprisingly, uh, we found that these uh, standard five students who were uh, to sit for their primary certificate examination this year in December, um, were barely able to read a story of two, uh, two minutes and 30 seconds. So we had 45 students who we um, were teaching every once a week for one hour. They were not able to read a half a page story. You can see the font size, it's larger so that they can read, but they were not able to read. So uh, most of them. So uh, we went to the classrooms, keeping all this in mind that they are not able to read much. They cannot write if they, don't, if they haven't memorized. They cannot speak in English, again, if, if it's not a drilled one. Um, so we designed our lessons kind of in a bilingual way because the students wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise respond to our classes. Uh, and also, we had a backup plan. If the multimedia is not there, we will be able to uh, conduct our lesson. So on the left one, you can see that the class was conducted without any multimedia support because the school has only one multimedia and the device, which is um, run by one person only. And if he is absent from the school, nobody can use it. So we did not have it always. Um, so we had in our classrooms, we had group works, pay works, we had real life example, we had storytelling activity because this is what we have, uh, we planned. Uh, because uh, in a 2016 paper by Pitri Sestra, it was mentioned that uh, the primary school uh, learners, they were not enjoying the storytelling activity that they, do, they were doing by then. So we had storytelling with each lesson. Um, and uh, as part of the uh, success story from so far what we have done, these little children 
Sorry, Rabi, to interrupt, but your slides are not advancing. So we see one slide for the phases of the project only. Okay, okay. So let me just give a new share if it improves. No, it's it's going now. Can you see it now? We can see slide 11 that says classes. Yes, it's fine. Okay. Can I continue? Yes, sure. Thank you. So um, the success uh, part of this story is that these little children, they would stay one hour and a half extra for us after their class time. And they really loved staying because every week when we went there, they would come running to us telling that, why did you come every day? So that is uh, something that indicated that students were enjoying our class. And um, I, I kind of have a mixed reaction from my student teachers uh, when I asked them to share their, because after every class, student teachers uh, submitted a report. So um, the reports definitely show the, um, the limitations that we have in a low resource context like ours. It's very much obvious that we don't have the resources, proper resources. We don't have duster, we don't have proper lighting, we don't have um, uh, well-decorated walls. Uh, but the one that you can see in the second um, uh, screenshot, can you, can you see the screen, everyone? Can you see uh, slide number 12? No. 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 Can you see it now? Okay, so it's going, I guess. Okay, uh, if it doesn't, then I will try once and then I will talk. It's all right. Okay, so uh, the, there was this one observation given by one of the student teachers where she was teaching about gender. And at one part, she was trying to make students understand about the women empowerment. And she surprisingly found that boys have a disrespectful thought about women and even for their mothers. Now, this is something worrisome. This is something the curricular designers can take into consideration. And they have to include more and more lessons so that the perspective changes. Um, I do hope that the perspective must change um, because we uh, are in this era where, in fact, in Bangladesh, we have somehow gender uh, parity or disparity, there's a debate on that, uh, in terms of enrollment for girls. So uh, this viewpoint must be changed. Um, the, I would like to conclude these observations with a positive note that my student teachers did understand the need of teaching these underprivileged children. They, uh, they really felt that they do need to help these children with their education. And they felt that these children have the hunger for knowledge and they should be helped. Um, now, if, is there any decentric perspective in my project or in the Belta project? Yes, there is. Because Belta's vision and mission uh, is to help and empower the teachers. But in this project, which is a student-oriented project, um, students went to teach students. So this time, uh, the project aims to help teachers, instead of teachers, students in the classrooms. And they have taken the action. and. Uh, in fact, students are helping those who barely are helped. So the uh, project aim to uh, bring significant and direct impact on both of the target groups, the underprivileged children who uh, do not get uh, quality education and the uh, undergraduate students who uh, sometimes uh, lack the um, career-oriented teaching who sometimes lack lifelong learning. And I would like to hear, um, relate to what Martin told in the beginning, that he told that always we have been designing projects or taking initiatives to help teachers to help learners. That is an indirect buyer method. But in this project, we try to reach students directly. So I would also uh, like to uh, relate with what Harriet told, that classroom can bring peace. And yes, through this project, because uh, in this project, one of the elements was to teach stories in every lesson, targeting global peace. So we had uh, our lessons designed for environment, for dishonesty, for peace and war, uh, for unity. So 
these things were taught to students while the, uh, they were taught in English, while they were taking part in uh, the classroom engaged activities. So uh, that's all about the project that is ongoing. We really hope that it come, uh, sees its end and we can finish it. Uh, if you have any questions or queries, you can reach me at this email address. Thank you, everyone. Thank you once again, Harry. Thank you, Africa Tissot. Thank you. And, th and thank you very much, uh, Rabia, for sharing with us your, your, your project. We are going to come back to you just so that we are sure we're tracking time. We would come back to, to you and Harriet with questions. We've got some questions popping up, but maybe for this webinar, we would have all the questions uh, at the same time. And there are questions for you as well, Martin. So, 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 so <laughs> keep an eye here. Um, Maria Laura, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Harry. Um, first of all, I'd like to start talking a little bit about APIVA, and later on, I will focus on APIVA on tour. Um, APIVA is a professional association of graduate English teachers in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And since in foundation um, in 1971, it provides access to professional development opportunities for its members. For example, um, APIVA organizes different events such as an annual conference, an conference, uh, six meetings and talks. But most of these educational activities usually take place in the city of Buenos Aires or La Plata, which is the capital city of the province, which means that many of our members uh, can participate. Um, one of APIVA's objectives is to foster links among teachers in the city and the province of Buenos Aires. So the purpose of APIVA on tour is to support the professional development of English teachers of Greater Buenos Aires and the province of Buenos Aires. Because um, many teachers who live uh, in, many, in, in small cities have few opportunities of participating in conferences and training sessions. Uh, what's more, they sometimes don't have access to digital devices or to internet connection. So they find uh, hard to join on, online um, to participate in different webinars. And then traveling from the province to the city of Buenos Aires tends uh, to be expensive. So then uh, APIVA on tour, and this is our logo, was launched in 2016 in response uh, to the present need to foster a spirit of collaboration among uh, teachers and teacher trainees. And then in 2011, we introduced certain changes to the program as we wanted to establish partnerships in different regions in uh, the province of Buenos Aires. In fact, we wanted to ensure that the activities were geared towards meeting the needs of local teachers and classrooms. We didn't want to take a speaker uh, from the city of Buenos Aires to just give a presentation without knowing much about the local reality. Uh, we wanted to do something uh, different. We wanted to include local voices to highlight the relevance of co-constructions co of knowledge in collaborative um, setting. Uh, we wanted uh, to empower teachers and to give teachers the possibility of showing what they are doing. Um, and um, that's the whole spirit um, in, 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 of this program. And it works in the following way. Uh, we usually contact different institutions, that is to say teacher training colleges and regional states run teacher development centers. And we present the projects and um, then, um, well, we ask them if they would like to join us, if they want to participate. And, and you know that um, the province of Buenos Aires is the largest and most heavily populated in the country, uh, which means that we can't visit or, or go to different places. We need to plan in advance and select certain uh, small cities, that is to say maybe six or eight cities uh, per year. Um, and then we start organizing the agenda of the, the, the events. 
Um, that is to say, we gather information about their specific needs, needs in order to think about possible topics, um, mm. topics of the workshops and to think about the speakers and uh, also our partners um, start developing lists with local teachers who'd like to share um, their, their, their practices and, and maybe possible topics that they uh, find that may be useful and relevant for teachers in, in those specific regions. So then a few on tour events provide opportunities for sharing experiences, ideas, teaching techniques, uh, classroom research, and pedagogical resources between in-service and future teachers. Because sometimes we also want uh, uh, local future teachers to participate in, in these events. Um, so um, all in all, um, and I have my, uh, on the van, which is really small right there, you can't see the words uh, that are, um, like keywords of our projects, but I prepared this um, poster. So a few on tour um, is about building a strong professional network. It's about uh, fostering understanding, solidarity and inclusion among English teachers with the aim of nurturing collaborative learning. Um, a few on tour is about growth, professional growth. Uh, challenging ourselves to move from our comfort zone in order to explore our teaching practices and to reflect on um, to reflect on what we do and to share this with other teachers. And um, finally, it's about uh, getting inspiration from other teachers and valuing local voices. Um, as uh, Martin was mentioning at the very beginning. Um, the idea is to empower teachers uh, to work and, and, and to show respect to what they do and to really value local voices um, so that teachers can, can share and, and work on their own ways uh, to help language learners. That's all. Thank you. Powerful. That's nice, um, Maria. Thank you very much for that. I like the interaction between the pre-service and the in-service, that collaboration of pre-service and in-service uh, teachers. I think it, it will strengthen the whole team together because many times there's a, a cutoff between the two. Uh, pre-service teachers, when they get to work, they are strangers, they know nothing, and the experienced teachers don't always, you know, embrace them. So the, I, I think I like that. Um, I guess it's now time for us to go through the questions and thank you all for thank your you. stories. I'm going to hand over to Harry to got, with the first question. Sure, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, I, I'll start with the one that's very specific to Harriet's uh, project. And I think it's Rina Figuera uh, asked the question, given the complex situation that you described, Harriet, and the data you gathered through your questionnaires, because you talked about uh, distributing questionnaires, how did you decide on the source of expertise that was needed uh, in developing your program? How did you decide in your training program, the modules that you, 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 you delivered? Was there a balance between metropolitan and I don't know what metropolitan means in this case, but maybe foreign and, and well, foreign in terms of outside your, your region of the country, expertise and local expertise, or was it all local expertise to address the complex challenges? Uh, and she's asking this in relation to the, the centering uh, theme. So, yeah, thank you very much, Harry. Can you get me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we remember I said we were working just with the functional schools. We gave the questionnaire just the functional schools and a few functional schools are only within the city area. The branches 
the sub branches, in the divisions, and in the districts, schools are actually not going on there. So the schools we access are those in Bamenda Central Town, in the regional capital. So we, when we collected the, the questionnaire, we worked on them, and then we saw what was raised, what was raised. For example, I have some questionnaires here, like for the students, there was a domain where we asked, now that you are back in school, what area of studies is your major problem? And then we had something like reading, writing, spelling, attentive listening, speaking fluently, critical thinking. And we realized that the students were taking almost all of that. All of that, they had problems with all of that. Having stayed away from, uh, from school for one, two, three, and as of this year, four years. We equally had something like, suggest some innovations to be made for learning to be comfortable. We gave them the suggestions like, additional learning period, makeup classes, follow up of learners progress, student teacher dialogue, regular homework, and they ticked all of that, that that is exactly what they needed. So this is actually where, what we use as our foundation to come up with those modules. And then when we look, when we look amongst ourselves, we said, no, first and foremost, we didn't have, uh, Hornby gave us 50% of what we, we presented. So the, the resources, were re the phones were really tight, but we thought we could do something even at our level. So that is why we now look for these teachers. Remember I said the, the five teachers in the team, they are teachers of at least 15 years teaching experience, uh, examiners, all of us are examiners with the GCE board. And then we teach with the government, we teach with the lay private, and then we teach with the mission. So it is just this background that we sort brought together and came up with the models and presented what we could present. It was all local based. So okay, so you're you're right. Uh, okay, that's 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 good to know that the expertise came from within, uh, from amongst you rather than from some someone else. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, and I can I can I can tell given the situation itself, I don't see an expert flying from elsewhere into a war-torn zone with very little protection. And I think this example tells us why, captures why t it is important that teachers depend on their own specific expertise rather than on someone else who would come when it is fair and might not be able to be there, not necessarily because they don't want to, but because the circumstances don't allow them to be there when teachers actually need them. The other question that comes from Facebook, um, that was Tatiana on Facebook, um, said, should we completely change the, our approaches to education? Um, should we abandon what is central and standardized for local practices? And I guess that's a question to everyone, maybe beginning with Martin. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, no, I don't think we should. I mean, I don't think realistically our, our governments are going to give up having national curricula, so they're going to exist in any case. So I think it's not abandoning the notion of um, all learners being helped to learn similar skills and understandings, but I think we do need to abandon the notion that all learners can be helped in identical ways and that every teacher needs to follow exactly the same route and route through through the curriculum and cover the curriculum at exactly the same rate uh, purely in order to be able to usually take exactly the same exams at the end of the year. I mean, I think, I think we should be, from our teacher, teacher education programs, preparing teachers to understand that the teacher education we provide can provide a starting point for their professional practice, but it's only a starting point and actually they're going to need to adapt what they do and how they do it, how quickly they do it, the manner in which they do it, to the realities of the schools that they're in. 
So I don't think we're saying, I mean, it would be stupid of us to say, actually, that let's, uh, let's, you know, start again and let everybody create their own curriculum and everybody create all their own materials and everybody do everything independently because that's completely unfeasible. However, I think it's, a, it's the, the messages we are sending to teachers and to trainee teachers about you are going to have to, all of us need to actually adapt what we do to the realities of the teachers and learners and places that we are doing it in. And that should that is part of our skill as a teacher. This is why teachers are such skilled people, because they are capable of doing this. And we should be applauding it and encouraging it and preparing each other to do it rather than trying to insist that everybody everywhere does exactly the same thing in exactly the same way. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. We had a question from Sayali, uh, which came from Facebook, and the question was, what do you plan exactly in teacher development programs? But I, I don't know if he's been, he or she, I, I can say, has been listening because these are specific teacher uh, development programs which had specific issues that were addressed. And I guess uh, planning whatever the content, of the, the plan, the content of each teacher education a development program would depend on the specific needs of the teachers. So I don't think there's a general answer we can provide. But no, I, so I think there's one general point one can make is that if one's offering a teacher professional development program, one has to actually understand the experiences of the teachers who are attending that program before yeah. one can really define exactly what one's going to do in that program. So I, I, I think over planning before you know who you are actually working with yeah. is one of the reasons why things don't work often. Yeah, and, 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 and another thing, and that's coming from my experience with external expertise, and I mean external in, in, in the broader sense of it. I mean, I really mean external to the classroom, to the context, and it could be someone from within the same country because I have I worked as a national inspector in my country for, for several years. But I still went and, and I taught in different at different levels in different types of rural and urban schools. But I still went to classrooms where I, I was completely lost. I thought I knew what was happening, but I didn't know anything. But the problem with teacher education is that people jet in and in a week or in a few days they claim knowledge of a context in such a way that the the, the thing they can make a, a huge difference. And I just think that every teacher education or teacher training uh, uh, episode should be accompanied by some uh, 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 a, a built-in uh, capacity building component for those people on the ground to then develop that uh, 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 in, in a sustainable way because no matter how good our intentions are we can only in in a month or in a week of training get just a tiny piece of the whole puzzle in the context in which we, we work. Question from Melanie on Facebook, uh, and it goes to Maria Laura. Could you please share some of the challenges you face with the APIBA tour? How are you getting your teachers to be actively involved and to take charge of their professional growth? That question came from Melanie Kikishi in Cameroon. Okay. Um, well, we face many challenges, um, financial challenges as well. Uh, I mean, um, organizing uh, our tours takes a lot of time and, and energy in the sense that we, we usually contact institutions um, and, and, and well, we, we need to select some cities. Sometimes they contact us, but we can't go everywhere. So then uh, sometimes one year we go to certain cities and the following year we go to other cities. And then when we work together on the content or of the, um, of the events, uh, we really need to, to gather information and to understand uh, local needs so that uh, the external speaker or the one we take sometimes from the city of Buenos Aires to the province is someone who um, understands and shows 
something that is relevant from that context and it's something that teachers really want to to explore or discuss and then another challenge is um that sometimes it's the first time teachers are going to present or in the case of um uh, future teachers maybe they uh they just present uh, final uh, products that they designed at the teacher training college but they are afraid of sharing that or sometimes teachers feel that what they do in their classroom is not relevant so uh, they, they, they don't they want, don't to, want to, to, to show that. Show that. Um, um, so okay. that's another so that's challenge, another encouraging challenge. them to to participate and, and to interact and to share and give a presentation or even design a workshop related to what they usually do in in their classrooms and then of course as was as referring uh, uh, talking about um, financial issues well of course uh, some uh, cities are far away so we need to consider uh, to travel to those places to get a project, so a computer, because sometimes these teacher training colleges or these centers don't have the right equipment, so we need to take that. Uh, we need to design flyers and invite sometimes local authorities or um, try to reach all local teachers so they, they uh, attend the event. Um, so there are many, um, challenges that we usually need to face and that's why planning in advance is so important we start some months before actually uh, visit, uh, before visiting all these um, small cities okay. something that came from uh, a, a, a detail that i picked from harriet's uh, presentation had to do with the relationship with uh, Dr. Gladys Focho, who is in working at a tertiary level, and that kind of partnership between uh, 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 colleagues in, in higher education and an and actual practicing teacher, which was not very directive, because clearly it was the teachers who directed a lot of your work, but you're working with someone uh, who, who, who could guide and support and provide uh, uh, all the, 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 the assistance and the mentoring you needed. Uh, I, I wonder, Rabia, if that's something that you consider because we've had cases in the past where higher education experts tend to be the center of knowledge and their relationship with the practicing teachers is just a relationship of training. So you come and let's train you rather than you come and let's work together to see how best we can deliver this in a way that is appropriate to your your, your specific uh, working uh, circumstances. So how do you negotiate that, that relationship? You're muted. If I rephrase your question, is, is this about um, uh, teacher associations or uh, the higher education uh, professors or the uh, teachers teaching, school teachers and college teachers, right? Training, not teaching, yeah. training. Right? So is this a, a common scenario in Bangladesh or not? It is well, well, I'm just thinking about how you work on that, how you, what's the relationship between uh, secondary and maybe primary teachers and, and colleagues in higher education in terms of teacher development initiatives like the one that you, you, you're talking about? Thank you. Uh, if, we, if we start from Belta, because I belong to Belta, Bangladesh English Language Teachers Association, DC members that we have here includes uh, teachers from schools, colleges, and universities. So that is the beauty of it. Uh, but the fact is, it is true that even in our context, it is kind of top down. So the university or higher education teachers train uh, primary or secondary school teachers. That is much common to the context. But uh, recently, there are some changes. We can see primary teachers doing research. We can see secondary teachers coming up, going for uh, Fulbright um, projects or green projects in their own uh, context, in their own uh, schools and premises. So changes are happening, but that is definitely uh, in kind of uh, in a slower pace than it is expected. But uh, it is top down. It was top down. Uh, it was uh, quite centric. It was top down for long. Um, there is an art for the change, 
um, the uh, Belta in fact advocates for the change. Uh, time to time it arranges seminars, conferences, and in fact uh, teaches a uh, development program where, um, in fact, we have, uh, last time we had this school of my uh, research programs with the schools and uh, teachers from schools and colleges where they conducted the same research in their own context, in their own schools, with their own students. So the changes are taking place uh, in a slower pace, um, like the decentric uh, ELT changes. The changes will come uh, gradually and we will hope for the better change and positive change in, a, in days to come. Now, one thing I'd like to, we didn't mention at the beginning, none of the projects that we have showcased in this series were actually conceived as decentering projects. Right. The notion of decentering is a, project, is a notion that's being developed uh, now within the Hornby uh, Trust. But these examples, these projects that we've shared through this program, uh, to, through the, the four webinars, have been those projects that we saw to be highlighting a component of, or at least something that showcases the idea of decentering. So these projects were not designed to uh, as decentering projects. No, please. So uh, we don't expect the, our particip our panelists, to be responding to decentering questions. A, uh, um, as if they were experts in that, and there's yet no expertise in the notion of decentering yes. ELT. It's something that's being developed, but we can agree at, I think it's shown through the different webinar, webinars, that there's a, there are some common grounds for understanding decentering, the whole idea of building on local, or celebrating local expertise more uh, than has been done before, and, and harnessing and developing local expertise. Uh, there's a question from Mohamed Latif from La Une in Morocco, um, and he said, what are the aspects of an inclusive capacity building program involving teachers in these projects? How can the projects that you have all been talking about support teachers to grow into decision makers and leaders within their uh, specific or their immediate environments? And that question is up for anyone who wants to say a word. Well, I mean, yeah, I, it's, it seems to me that Harriet, Harriet's project, uh, in the sense that it's, um, led teachers of other subjects to ask Harriet and her, um, her team to come and uh, share, share some of their work with them and also led the local district education officer or whoever it was, the, so the representative of the official system to uh, recognize what you yeah. were doing and to support and to encourage and support what you were doing in a, in a sense that to me shows that you you at least even if not the teachers with whom you were working were actually being um what what was the question again how can that where we're actually developing yeah we're actually being encouraged by the by the environment in which you were working, from both the official and the and the school environment in which you were working, both the administrative and to participate to to carry on and think of ways in which you could actually adapt what you were doing to different to different circumstances. Yeah. Presumably, also, I mean, um, no, Rabia's Rabia's uh, trainee teachers through the um experience of actually doing some property some real teaching with real students in a real school rather than the sort of pretense that most uh, practicums are where being uh seriously supported uh to develop i've forgotten what the question is so i can't can't say yeah, exactly the right words but anyway you're actually answering my next question which was oh, what perfect. was centering about this project so carry on Ah, right. Well, well, yeah, okay. 
Well, and 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 I mean, you know, Maria Laura's uh, interact as people have already said, the interaction between the trainee teachers and the experienced teachers working together to actually uh, develop well to work out locally appropriate versions of national efforts um, is also a sort of <laughs> whatever it is capacity capacity building <laughs> capacity building but in terms of de decentering I mean I suppose you know I mean I think all of these projects represented as you've already said Harry a, you know a, a focus on local needs using local expertise um, trying to support local teachers and or learners who are actually having really quite difficult times in most circumstances um, encouraging learners teachers and students and uh, learners and teachers and trainers maybe to move beyond their comfort zones to actually do things that they hadn't done before and develop confidence in themselves in the ways that they hadn't done before and also um, to a degree disseminating what they were doing I mean in Maria Laura's uh, case through the trundling of the mighty bus um, in uh, Harriet's case through the working with teachers of other subjects and the local educational administrators and in Rabia's case I guess hopefully your colleagues back at the, the university were also interested in what you and what are also interested and uh, Belta are also interested in what you're doing so I think they have they all show um, examples of, of a decentering orientation even if they weren't actually designed as decentering projects yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I'm just going to, and this would be the final question because we're running out of time, would be just to rephrase uh, Mohamed's question, uh, and this would be to the three uh, uh, panelists. Can you say that there are other teachers who were involved, other colleagues involved in your projects, who, whom you can go to sleep and say this would be capable project leaders going forward? So in other words, is there any evidence that in your wonderful projects you've also been able to 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 develop future leaders who would go ahead and do great things after you yes sir yeah thank you uh because your question has to do with my teaching philosophy uh as a teacher uh I'm still young, but still uh, my belief that I want to create the leaders, not the followers. So, and that is the reason basically um, I worked with my students every time with different projects. Um, and uh, the objectives of all these projects had to do with this uh, ownership, leadership, and learner agility. So, uh, somehow uh, we have. Uh, uh, the upcoming leaders, if they're not now, definitely on the way. Some of them are doing um, excellent uh, things at work at uh, different places. Sometimes I find various letters from students. Uh, one of the students wrote a letter to me that, uh, Madam, I did STS and students teaching students, STS. And today I had an exhibition in Dubai for my company, the owns a company. And everyone was uh, praising uh, my presentation, my demonstration. And I wanted to thank you because I've learned everything through my journey for STS. So uh, yes, if we can design it in a way, and if the objective is certainly to create leaders, not the followers, then definitely there can be some, some followers made out of it. And uh, if they are made, we can call ourselves successful. Uh, so this is what I think that yes, the leaders are on the way if they are not already in the destination, they are on the way. Yes. Yeah, my question was made, uh, was more practical rather than philosophical. In the particular projects that you have led, are there any people whom you think you've particularly supported 
in a way that can enable them to become leaders? Yes, um, uh, thank you, Harry. Uh, yes, uh, because we uh, had four student teachers who are still teaching. Our project is an ongoing one. I can't conclude saying that, yes, they have become experts, but they have shown expertise because the nature of the project involved them, uh, asked, required them to design the lessons, conduct the class, handle the students, handle the issues coming up so that, that they could actually successfully complete. So uh, yes, I can say that they accomplished um, and they can be the future leaders that we want. And there's actually evidence of that in, in the chat box. There's someone who just said something about, about your work, uh, uh, Rabia. Thank you. Any other comment from uh, Harriet and Maria? Harriet? Yes, yes, I have something to add. Yeah. I, think, I think with us, with us, the participants, we, did, we, we tried as much as possible to have teachers from all the branches, the seven branches of the Northwest region. So at least we had two teachers from those branches. And we are very certain that once we bounce back to normalcy, those teachers will be our touch bearers to carry these models to their various branches. Again, the teachers resource unit under the Ministry of Education in our region, when I presented the award letter from CISOL to them that this is what we've been awarded to do, they were so happy and they told us they'll be preparing uh, an insemination seminar for young student teachers graduate, uh, who have just been posted to schools so that we can give them the idea of handling these uh, learners and teachers in a crisis situation. So I'm very certain that if we go to sleep, this project will not die. It is even my wish <coughs> that come, come uh, if we have to start school in October, God, God, God willing, we'll have to take the project all over. I mean, we'll take maybe a day to refresh and revitalize so that at least the educational industry in the Northwest can come back to what it has always been. Thank you very much, uh, Harriet. You meant Africa TISOL, not TISOL. Oh, thank you. That's the okay. correct. Maria Laura. Yeah, um, and in our case, in the case of Appeal on Tour, in, in general, the local teachers who participate in, in our events and, and deliver presentations and even um, teach uh, teachers to be, um, gain that confidence and, and understand that what they do in their classrooms is something relevant and important and they understand the, the idea of sharing and, and participating and creating networks and in many cases sometimes they, they want to expand what they do and start participating in conferences uh, that we design or uh, write uh, papers or articles or even start leading a special interest group in uh, their local community. It's not um, that they have um, that feeling that yes, we can do it, and it's not just that external local expert, the only one that has a voice uh, in 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 events. Um, and, and yes, um, that, that's the idea, and, and as I said before, the, the spirits. I mean, it, sometimes they become members of our um, association, and in other cases, they, uh, because, um, because of different reason, uh, reasons, they don't become members, but they follow what we do, and they uh, are active in the sense that, that they participate, and they send proposals or, or messages. Uh, they are there and they become more active as part of their own uh, community. All right, thank you. Uh, Martin, I guess we are concluding already and you've got an announcement, but before you do, could you uh, situate the centering within the context of globalization of education in terms of curriculum and pedagogy? Where is the place of the centering EOT at a time when we're looking to globalization in education? That is a question from Gladys Pochow. Right, I suppose it's actually a means to making globalization mean something. At the moment, globalization is mostly, in my opinion, globalization is mostly rhetoric. And we are attempting to develop sort of uh, context universal uh, nostrums for what 
21st century education means. I actually think while globalization probably is a, you know, something we can't stop, actually we're only going to achieve the benefits, if there are benefits of globalization, uh, if we actually have education systems that are capable of responding to uh, the needs of their of their own contexts. Mm -hmm. And while we can have a shared idea of what the English curriculum ought to be in our context of ELT, if we think that, that the learning and uh, use of English is an essential component of globalization, we then need to make sure that we match the way we uh, teach English to the realities of our own context and stop pretending that we can actually all, well, that we should, or that it's even desirable for everybody to do everything in exactly the same way. There are many ways of reaching the same, a, a similar rather than the same end point. And we should be working hard to work out how we can, in our own settings, um, help learners to move towards the desired end point in a way that makes sense to us as teachers and to them as learners. And now your announcement. Da 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 The Hornby Trust is happy to announce, oops, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that the number of uh, teacher association uh, grants that are available is in this coming year is now 15. Wow. Um, and the call for, where is it? The call for, the call for uh, proposals is now up on the Hornby Trust website. The deadline for applications is the 15th of September. And the focus is increasingly, if I may just point out to, the focus is on the role of teachers associations. And the way in which teachers associations can uh, support teachers, stimulate contextually appropriate thinking, uh, promote and support the sharing of local expertise. I mean, the things actually that uh, several of you have been uh, really talking, you know, that people have been talking about today, but more explicitly, the Hornby Trust is looking for um, teacher association projects that will emphasize uh, the decentering aspect of whatever the project is about. The funds, I mean, like as, as with this year, it's, it's the funds are up to 2000 pounds. There are 15 of them. Um, and we would be very, very happy to have lots and lots of applications. I think it, rather than talking my way through this proposal, I think I'd just like to uh, point out that while it's not compulsory, if I am available to help people with their project proposals, if they want any guidance in before, <coughs> they, before they actually send them in. In previous years, I guess about half of the, half of the applicants have, have um, contacted me before sending their, their, pro, their, their proposals in. I think it's probably worth doing if you've got the time to actually get somebody and somebody else to have, a, it doesn't have to be me even, it could be one of your other colleagues, but to get somebody else to look at your proposal um, is, is worthwhile if you can actually do it early enough. Um, I mean, we could go, this could take a long time, but I think it's better if people just look at this for themselves. Uh, if there are any specific questions, I'm very happy to answer those now. Uh, 
I'll just put up the Hornby Trust. Whoops. Now, is that actually being shared or am I imagining it? You shared your screen before and you, maybe you want right. to. Let me, let me share it again. Uh, but it's actually this one I want. Right, that doesn't work, does it? No, okay, you can only share. As you can see, I'm a blundering, blundering Zoom novice um, <laughs> who can't get the right thing on the screen at the right time. Oh yeah, there we go, great. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> if you go to that website, that is where you will find the application form. And if you've got any immediate questions about anything, please feel free to ask them now. But otherwise, I suggest you look through it. You look through it carefully um, in your own time. Um, the it's a it's a you know I think the the way that the Hornby Trust is expanding these projects year by year, expanding the number of these projects year by year, is a real sign of the way in which it's way in which all of us are all of us in this sort of decentering fraternity and sorority are uh, you know, grop groping our way towards trying to understand it better, but also really acknowledging how, how absolutely central it is to making the teaching and learning of English meaning, <laughs> genuinely meaningful to learners all over the world. And the big, big role that teachers associations can have in enabling that to happen. And I just wanted to add that for our Africa TISOL uh, affiliates, uh, um, the, the Africa TISOL leadership team is happy to, to support your projects. If you've got any brilliant ideas, you know exactly who your committee members are. Talk to them and they would help you uh, maybe look at your projects and, and make recommendations and or suggestions. Mm -hmm. And as you have been listening to the different projects, it doesn't necessarily need to be a national uh, to association doing a project. Um, uh, uh, Harriet's project, for example, is, is an example of just a, a, a regional chapter of an association doing their project because uh, um, that's a recognition that you have specific realities even if you're in the same country. So we'll be encouraging uh, our, our uh, Africa TISO affiliates who are interested in applying. I think the number has gone up, was it eight? Uh, last year or 10 to 15 was, our chances it was are, ten, yeah it was 10 last year it's 15 15, 15 this, this year. year so 15 yeah. projects up we would really want to have uh, as, of course we would want uh, our colleagues around the world and the global south to to benefit from this but particularly we would be very happy to support uh, our local affiliates in africa to run develop their own projects now, um, we are getting to the end. I just wanted to say thank you to, to the panelists, but the final thank you would come from Rita Bile, who would then uh, hand over to uh, Africa Tissot President, uh, Ayman El Sheikh, who's been the person running uh, the te technology from the background. Uh, before I go, I just wanted to, uh, to, to say next, on the 11th of of July, we would be having our monthly webinar, uh, our regular monthly webinar, and this would feature Liz England, who will be talking about TISOL career path development, creating professional success. And the link has already been posted here for people to register for that webinar. Over to you, Tabili. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you have just been tuned to the Africa TESOL DC. Would like to thank you all for participating and in a special way, we want to thank our panelists. We have learned a lot from you and I would like to imagine that as teachers in the different parts of the world, we have learned a lot, we've been inspired and we will start. Maybe you might find yourself receiving emails or, you know, how do you motivate me to do this and so on. So, so thank you very much. We have really learned a lot. In this day, um, in this era of decolonization of curriculum and so on, it is important for English language teachers 
to shift from the center and to start coming up with their own ways of uh, solving whatever problems. And uh, this has been a useful platform to try and motivate uh, everyone in the continent and outside the continent to think outside the box. Thank you very much. Over to you, President. Unmute yourself, Eamon. Here we go. Thank you very much, Harry and Rethabel, for uh, moderating this uh, webinar. I would also like to thank Hombi for supporting this webinar uh, series. And in particular, I would like to thank uh, Hombi trustees who were here with us, starting with Martin. We also had Richard and we had Amol. A big thank you to the panelists. We had 13 panelists who hailed from 11 different countries. And I would like to start with the panelists uh, in this webinar, webinar four, uh, Harriet Indukum from Cameroon, Rabia Bint Habib from Bangladesh, Marie Laura Garcia from Argentina. In webinar three, we had Rukundu Kanikoli from Rwanda, and we also had George Kanyama from Zambia, Tatiana Letikina from Kazakhstan, Ravi Chakrakudi from India. So this is uh, webinar three. In webinar two, we had three panelists, Paula Rebolado from Chile, Sagun Shriza from Nepal, Friedrich Odiambu from Kenya, and in webinar one, first webinar, we had three panelists, Dario Banegas from Argentina, Eric Ekembe from Cameroon, and Joseph Kaliba from the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. I would also like to thank you, the participants who joined us this evening and took time out of your uh, busy schedule. Uh, thanks a lot for being here with us. I would like to echo Harry again and announce that on July 11th, we have our regular monthly webinar, which will be given by Liz England on the topic of TESOL career uh, path development. I would also like to announce that in August, uh, August 15th, we will have our online symposium, and it will feature uh, more than 50, 15 presentations. So stay tuned for that and follow us on Facebook, check out our website for more information about these events. I would also like to invite those who are not members to join Africa TESOL, and I have already posted information about how to become a member in the chat box. So please consider becoming a member. And I would like to thank you again for coming, joining us, and we look forward to seeing you with us here in our future events. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, to... world. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Raymond. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot.